Hey, welcome back to another episode of Consciousness This Month. You know, this this episode was supposed to feature um, a discussion that I had with Ruth Milliken, uh, which I recorded July 4th. Uh, we spent three hours together that Wednesday, uh, an hour trying to get the Google Hangout live on air to work. Um, we were talking on the phone. I tried everything that I knew how to do, including some things I didn't know how to do to get that to work. It didn't work. So she was not able to join the, the live broadcast, which I had been intending uh, on using. And I didn't have a contingency plan. I didn't have a backup plan because this has always worked for me in the past. So I was kind of caught off guard. I didn't really know what to do. I was able to get her in a regular video. Um, call <clears throat> and so I thought I could use open broadcast software uh, studios to record the call and I set it up and I thought it was recording and then I found out afterwards that it had been just recording my side of the conversation so this is what I got uh -huh. that was incredibly disappointing we had a two-hour conversation where we covered many um, interesting themes of her work and it's uh, all just me <laughs> talking and then you can kind of hear whispering uh, of, of her response basically what was being recorded from her was simply um, the audio from my earbuds being picked up by the microphone hanging right here so there's a faint echo of her voice but nothing that's worth listening to so it was really frustrating to me um, and and I'm sure for her as well to spend all that time and have nothing to show for it of course I learned quite a bit and the discussion was quite quite enjoyable so <clears throat> so I thought that what I would do is try to give a summary an overview of the various things that we talked about and um, uh, kind of give a report on it now I don't really expect anyone to be interested um, and want to listen to this because uh, why would you want to hear me talking about Ruth Milliken you can read her work or talk to her yourself um, but this is more for my purposes, I guess. So if I ever look back on this, I'll kind of remember what the discussion was. So it's still kind of fresh in my mind. It's been about a week since the conversation. Um, so uh, I'll try to go over some of the main themes as, uh, as they came up. Um, you know, this is just, it was really disappointing to me because, um, well, Ruth is a very special person, a very, um, a person I've known for a very long time, one of the greatest living philosophers, I would say, currently around, and one of the nicest people I've ever met. So, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, I was actually a student at Ruth's when I went to the University of Connecticut. I was there for the academic year 2002-2003. I only took two classes with her. I had one that was kind of a philosophical analysis class. We read kind of a lot of the, uh, you know, Russell, Frege, Strauss, and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, Putnam, etc. So, and then the other class was on language thought and other biological categories, her seminal book. So um, well, we had those two courses, but I spent a lot of time talking and arguing with her, and uh, she made a big impact. In fact, when I was going to the University of Connecticut, a friend of mine at the time, a guy named Aaron Bogart, uh, said, oh, you're going to the University of Connecticut, so you can study with Ruth Milliken. And I said, well, I'm going there to study with Austin Clark, actually, was my plan. And he was like, oh, no, you got to study with Milliken. She is the next Kripke. And I was like, hmm, so who's Kripke. <laughs> so I remember I bought Naming a Necessity and uh, Milliken's book uh, on Clearly Confused Ideas and I read them on the plane over there and those are two very different um, approaches to philosophy and uh, it's kind of shaped a lot of my thoughts. So um, uh, it's, it was very nice to be able to talk to her and very disappointing, ultimately profoundly disappointing um, that the conversation didn't come out. I'm sure people would have found it interesting. So we started off our conversation uh, talking about realism and the correspondence theory of truth. And that's because I always want to start conversations on this podcast with, uh, with, with areas of commonality with whoever I happen to be talking with. So um, uh, uh, correspondence theory of truth is something that I have a special place in my heart for. It's something I, I think about a lot. And I, when I got to the Graduate Center in 2003 and I was studying with Paul Horowitz and all the deflationism was kind of rampant on so it was nice that there was someone around who was ably defending the correspondence theory. What I wanted to ask her was, what are the truth makers? What are the things to which our thoughts or um, uh, sentences or whatever are corresponding to? So her, her answer was that they correspond to what she called states of affairs. Um, states of affairs are things which can be articulated, uh, have parts and so forth. And, and pressing her on this a little bit, 
uh, I think what came out was that states of affairs are just uh, so natural kinds are the basis of this. Um, there's also historical kinds, etc. But the the natural kinds which exist for Ruth are those things which we can make induction inductive generalizations about. And so anything that we can make an inductive generalization about, which is going to give us some information about it uh, at a future point, is uh, for her a kind um, that we can gather information about. So I was trying to press her on this uh, issue, um, whether she thought there were so essences involved with these kinds. Um, so this is something which is familiar from you know work of Kripke and Michael Devitt, I think. So uh, the water being H2O is water is essentially H2O on that view, and the modal properties that are associated with that um, connect to that essence, uh, so that whether it's possible for water to be some other substance X Y Z or something like that ultimately depends on what the essential nature of uh, water is. So I was wondering if she had any kind of uh, sympathy with um, those kinds of views, and her answer was no, that there were no essences, um, but that these were just kind of clumps in nature, um, which we could inductively generalize over. So that led me to thinking that, gee, it was just kind of a lucky accident for that we ended up in a world where things clumped in this way. Um, and we talked about that for a while. So, you know, I was asking about how could things be different, and she expressed severe skepticism about possible worlds and analyzing possible situations. So I tried to appeal to the multiverse and to the idea that, well, there may, according to, this is sort of still in the realm of not testable empirically maybe, but it's less possible worldly, there may be universes where there are, uh, you know, very different laws of physics where we could not generalize about, say, the kind of water or even the atoms or, you know, hydrogen or whatever. And her response to that, um, her response to that is that, uh, her response to that was that if the world were different, radically different than the way it is, if we lived in a world where we couldn't make these kinds of inductive generalizations, then the kind of view that she has in mind just isn't going to work. So that it depends really um, on the fact that there, the, there are these stable clumps out there which can be characterized uh, in terms of the law of non-contradiction. So if something is red, then it can't also be blue. And uh, that kind of gives us a range of properties which we can generalize um, and make certain predictions inductively about the nature of that thing. So the, uh, the, the whole idea, it seems, of her philosophy would sort of not work had the world been different. I found that very interesting because my intuition had been that it would have been fine um, had the world turned out differently. We would have different tracking capacities and we would track different sorts of stuff out there. Um, but uh, so that was one very interesting point where um, I, I learned something. So, so after that, the discussion segue to proper function, which is the central notion of her um, positive account and um, you know this is kind of well known so I won't dwell on it but the idea of a proper function it has to do with the existence of current things being around because in the past they were selected to perform some some thing some function uh, so this is not a mathematical notion of function it's a biological notion or some other kind of notion so um, uh, to take a linguistic example which we talked about quite a bit think about the imperative mood you know giving orders um, the reason we have an imperative mood on her view is because it's succeeded in the past in getting people to do something. So issuing a command has got someone to uh, obey the command and people kind of copied that um, uh, because of the fact that it succeeded in the past. And so this act of reproduction or copying in these technical terms are defined in a way I don't want to really go into unless there's questions. but. Uh, so the idea of proper function then is that what the thing is supposed to do, and that's why it's proper, and what it's supposed to do is determined by what it was selected for, what, what um, it competes against other things, and then there are uh, winners and losers and so forth. So uh, we talked a lot about you know semantics versus pragmatics at this point. And um, <clears throat> you know, Ruth has this very interesting idea that language can be interpreted just as a natural sign. So her example is take, it's raining. Um, uh, you don't need on her view to understand some kind of communicative attention. 
um, or something like that, you, you can you can interpret the sentence "It's raining" simply as a sign of the fact that it is raining. In exactly the same way that if you hear the pitter patter of the raindrops outside, you can say to yourself, "Oh, well, that's an indication or a, um, a sign that that rain is occurring." So, on her, this was kind of. Um, uh, um, uh, on her view, this was an anti-compositionality point, so that she, she claims that we don't learn you know, words first and then put them together and, and set them into the sentences. Instead, what we do is we kind of copy whole chunks of language. Um, you know, it's raining, or uh, what time is it, or things like that. And we copy them from other people's utterances precisely because we they're successful. And so these things get reproduced and hang around in the language um, because they've served a certain job and they continue to serve that job. That doesn't mean they always succeed, by the way, obviously. If I issue a command, it doesn't mean that every time I do it, it's obeyed. But the point is that um, the reason why I'm issuing that command on her view is because in the past it's been successful, and that's why it keeps getting copied. Um, so that was very interesting. And when I was a graduate student, we, her and I argued a lot about Gricean <laughs> ideas because I was, and still am, uh, attracted to the Gricean view, the neo Gricean view. Um, and so we discussed for a while, uh, you know, whether you can issue a command without intending to issue a command, whether you can obey the command without recognizing the person's issue. So those are interesting questions. But ultimately, I think that what it came down to me and what we discussed towards the middle of our conversation was the notion of communication. So, so my, I pressed her on this idea. My, my view was, look, you can tell her story and accept it, and that's wonderful. Uh, and, and I do, for the most part, think that that's a good way of thinking about some aspects of language. But I don't think that you can talk about communication that way. Uh, in particular, the idea that communication is a cooperative endeavor. Um, so if you utter something like it's raining, then I can take that as a natural sign, and I don't have to think about you as an agent communicating to me. Uh, but in order for me to know that you are trying to communicate something to me, I have to figure out what your intentions are, uh, this kind of um, communicative intention, an intention whose fulfillment is its recognition. Um, so I have to sort of intend that you recognize that I'm trying to communicate to you and that intention is fulfilled when you do so recognize. And so she was like, no, language can just be interpreted as natural signs. And I was like, yes. But what about the case of communication, in particular, communication? That's a cooperative endeavor if, to know whether you're making a joke or issuing a command or just rehearsing a speech. I have to figure out what you're intending to do. What, what is it you're trying to get me to figure out on the basis of what you're saying? And her idea was, yeah, there's cooperation, but it comes earlier. It comes at the point where you're copying the language um, from other people. It's built in at a different level. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and uh, there was no resolution to that, obviously, but uh, one area where we kind of uh, ad agreed was that, um, uh, so you may not learn the language compositionally, if, you know, I'm, I'm non-committal on that, I think we get concepts of composition, that's a different story, but uh, whether you learn it in chunks or bit by bit, there's this thing at the end where you decompose the things into their constituent elements, that's decompositionality, and she seemed to be okay with that approach. So decompositionality was something that she was uh, um, very, very uh, uh, congenial towards. So at that point we switched to talking about meaning rationalism and this is something that uh, is very counterintuitive. So you know th there's this idea coming from Descartes that we have clear ideas that to know what the ideas are about or what they are, uh, what they refer to or somehow their contents um, uh, simply requires that we get clear and introspect and find the meaning in consciousness, so to speak. And all, most of her work is devoted to denying that claim. So according to her claim, it's an empirical question whether we're thinking about something um, or whether we're not, we think we are, but are mistaken about it. So uh, uh, it's not something that we can know a priori. We can't know that our thoughts have any meaning or that our words have any meaning or that we're thinking about something as opposed to nothing, um, simply by examining the contents of our consciousness. But what was interesting was that what came out of the conversation was that she thinks that, well, gee, there are often ways that we get empirical evidence on posteriori that our concepts are not vacuous or that our um, thoughts have meaning. And so we can come to get pretty good evidence. We don't ever get to the point where we're certain, 
but we can come to the point where we have pretty darn good evidence that, for instance, my thoughts about water are not vacuous, or my thoughts about the morning star, and, and so forth. So um, I thought that was a kind of interesting idea that a lot of people don't take from her work, because a lot of people sort of think that, well, I, I mean, at least maybe I'm wrong about this, but it seemed to me that um, many people want to say that, on her view, uh, we never know um, what the contents of our thought are. And, and really her beef is with the claim that we know a priori, that we can tell that my water concept is about something without having to do anything except um, attending closely. And this would go all even to claims which some people think uh, are immune from these kinds of things, like with respect to phenomenology. And that's where we, we turn to next. So uh, I asked her about mm -hmm whether we could, what she feels about introspection. Like, um, so if we want to know the meaning of our sentence and what, what we're thinking about, that's one thing, but what about what we're experiencing at the moment? Now, she gave me a very stern warning. She said, look, I don't want to talk about consciousness. <laughs> and I wanted to respect that, but I also wanted to try to press her on something that she had said um, in a paper that she wrote for the online consciousness conference called An Epistemology for Phenomenology. And I think her main point there is extremely important and very interesting. So the main point was that um, if you want to talk about phenomenology or consciousness or phenomenal qualities or something like that, then you've got to do epistemology first. You have to say what it would mean to have a, um, some kind of idea of what's going on in your own mind and you have to start by talking about things in the external world and you don't start your epistemology from introspection and saying, well, there are these qualities there. So you have to give a epistemological account first and then ask the question, okay, what does that tell us about our own experience? <clears throat> so for her, the epistemology part comes in our theory of unicepts and unitrackers. And so we spent some time talking about that. So uh, she's abandoned the notion of concepts uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, concepts are supposed to be public that people share or something like that. And she doesn't think that there are such things like that. So instead she's got these ideas of unit trackers, which is a capacity for tracking information about one certain thing. Um, and then we have these things called uniceps, which is the storage of information about the one thing. And it's not like a folder. It's more like the connections which exist between the various bits of information that is the unicep. So that was very interesting. And, and we talked a lot about that before. I got distracted at this point by asking her about machine minds. And so I uh, said, well, look, if unit trackers are simply the capacity to track information about the same thing, then, then what do we say about Google's Deep Dream or Deep Mind um, or any kind of pattern classifying software where you take something, you train it up to uh, distinguish between cats and non-cats, you have this algorithm and you just show it billions of pictures. And somehow the algorithm picks out, you don't know what, but something <laughs> which allows it to answer the question, yes or no, is it a cat? And they get pretty good. Uh, is this a cat? Yes. Is that a cat? No. And there are pictures from different angles, different kinds of cats, different lighting. So it's very interesting that they're sort of tracking, it seems, um, this one common thing. And her answer was, yeah, that seems like a, a unit tracker. And then when I said, okay, so can these machines also have uniceps? Her answer seemed to be, well, it depends on what the information is being used for. Um, it depends on what's doing what, what, the, what it's doing with this. So she didn't seem to be uh, really against the idea of machine minds or machines doing this thing that she's interested in, which I, I found interesting. So um, uh, that, was, that was cool. But really the central idea that came out of this section was that um, we don't have direct access to our mind in this a priori way. So then we have to have a theory about how it is we could track or have information about our own minds. Um, and then once we do that, we, we realize that, uh, um, well, sh that all perception is theory laden, according to her, and this is kind of Solarzian thing, that everything in perception is theory laden. And uh, because of that, um, even when it comes to knowledge of our own minds, we're into a theory er theory laden area, so that it's not gonna be the case that we just have this kind of unmediated access to the nature of our conscious experience, but it's always gonna be filtered by the kind of theory that we bring to, um, to the table. And of course, if we have a bad theory, this is really the important point, I think. If we have a bad theory of what the mind is like, then we're going to be misled. And so uh, we talk a lot about phlogiston and chloric. So chloric is an old idea that there was this kind of fluid which was in things which could be released 
as heat or something like that. Um, and it gave explanations, you know, for why it is that uh, um, uh, uh, if, if you take something which is burning and cover it with an airtight place, the fire goes out. The idea was, well, the caloric is saturated in the air and there's no more or something like that. So you could also even feel it because you felt something when you got, felt put your hand on something hot, you would feel the warmth and that people was interpreted as uh, experiencing this, this property. Of course, property doesn't exist and we know now that uh, combustion is kind of oxidation, blah, blah, blah. So uh, the point there was that if you have a bad theory, you're gonna find things which seem to confirm it. Um, and so if you have a bad theory of the mind, you're gonna find things which, which you think or interpret um, uh, uh, in, in that way. And so that's the, that's the, um, uh, that's the danger here is that, uh, if we just jump right into doing consciousness without giving a theory about how it is we could know about it, then we run the risk of importing assumptions, bad, bad theory, um, into, uh, into the mind itself, into the phenomenological data. And I think that's a very important point. Um, which isn't addressed enough. Uh, there are people who say, well, they find these simple elements in their things which can't be analyzed any further. And then you wonder, okay, so, and then they start their whole philosophy from that idea. Um, and then you wonder, okay, but is that a bad theory? And what would it mean to have a good theory? So we segued at that point to talking about the identity theory and uh, judgment of identity. And for her, this is something that's very special, recognizing that two things really are the same thing as kind of a a monumental achievement. Um, and so I wanted to ask her about Waters H2O or Mark Clemens is um, sent with uh, Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, so on her view, these don't express things which correspond to the world. They tell us how concepts or unicepts are related to each other. So if I say um, Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens, I haven't said something which is true that. I haven't said something which describes the world on her view. Um, but I've said something which tells me how to think about the world, that these two UNICEFs, which I thought were tracking um, two different individuals, really are tracking the same individual. So it's a it's a, a, a way, what we've learned is how to think about the world. We haven't learned something about the world, uh, which I found interesting. So then I said, well, what about things like the mind is the brain? What about identity statements or judgments involving, um, uh, on the one hand, mental things, and on the other hand, uh, physical things? and at that point, she was kind of flustered by my breezy assumption that we sort of knew what the mind was uh, without doing all of this extra work. So if we had a good theory of the mind, um, then we could make sense of these things on her. But un until we do that work first, then um, those kinds of things, she thinks that the mind is the brain is not anything like water is H2O or Santa Clemens is Mark Twain, um, simply because on her view, we don't know enough about the mind at this point. So I thought that was a very interesting, uh, interesting idea. So at this point, I'm kind of, you know, kind of going quick here. It's already getting long, but at this point we switched to talking about um, some skeptical arguments about natural selection. And we talked about Kripke's, um, uh, the Kripkenstein paradox, about rule following and also Fodor's argument uh, that uh, natural selection is intentional and so therefore uh, has a problem. And you know, Fodor, she laughed at that idea, I felt very rightly. Um, and she says she, she reported that she was at a conference recently and someone brought this up and she stood up and said, does anyone here know what intentionality is with an S? Nobody did, of course. Now, of course, we all know what intentional contexts are um, where substitution of co-referential terms fails. Like, you know, you could believe that Samuel Clemens was a great, nice person and think that Mark Twain was a, you know, jerk or something like that. Um, so there, the substitution of co-referential terms fails. And um, that we understand, but on her view, it's just kind of laughable that uh, there's a puzzle here about what's getting selected for. So you take the frog snapping at the black BB dot or a fly, uh, on her view, it's just kind of obvious which one of those things was um, uh, successful in the past of keeping the frog alive. It's not snapping at the black dots, it's snapping at the fly. So if your question just is, what is the frog, excuse me, what has the frog's ancestors done in the past which contributed to their survival? It's snapping at nutritious flies. Um, 
And so there doesn't seem to be any kind of puzzle there. Uh, although I did ask whether there would be kind of a puzzle about um, us saying what the right thing was. That's an epistemological claim and not something that she seemed to be very interested in. Now, of course, for the Kripke paradox of rule following, she gives the same answer. So how do we say which rule is being followed? Well, she appeals to the proper function. Um, so uh, which rule is the frog following? Um, is determined by what the proper function of the frog in this case is. In this case, it's snapping at something nutritious and delicious. So uh, I think proper function does a lot of work for her, and whether you agree with it or not, it's, it's a very powerful idea. Now, of course, um, this we were already getting into the hour and a half plus mark at this point, so I, I transitioned uh, to talking about Swamp Man um, and her view uh, that Swamp Man um, molecule for molecule duplicate, duplicate of her sprung into existence, has no mental states, no content. Um, and she has some very interesting things to say about that. Um, um, namely that, well, you shouldn't just try to take Swamp Man sort of a la carte and have an intuition about it, but rather you have to have a theory first, which has some evidence for it. And then you look at Swamp Man. And according to her view, yeah, um, the Swamp Millican shows up. It's a duplicate. It's lightning struck a log. And sh duplicate pops up and then it goes home and teaches her classes and, and talks to her children and they make these inductive generalizations but at that point it's just luck it's just luck that um, according to her these things work because there is no history to this thing nothing that was selected for nothing which competed against other things and so forth so i always found that very interesting and so i wanted to get her reaction to crispr technology at this point and so I brought up this scientist who's trying to recreate the woolly mammoth. And what he's doing is taking DNA that they get from fossils and splicing it into the elephant genome, trying to produce uh, uh, a modern day woolly mammoth. And so um, I you know, brought up the fact that the woolly mammoth lost the evolutionary struggle. It was selected against, uh, they, they don't exist anymore, they're extinct. So now we're splicing it into something which has been around and we're altering the DNA. And I asked, so are, you know, does this thing have proper functions? Is it going to have mental content, visual states, which track things? And surprisingly, her answer was, who cares? <laughs> so I don't care. Um, she doesn't care about that sort of stuff. And, you know, I thought that was kind of a, an interesting answer. She just does whether this thing has proper functions or not, who knows? And, you know, if we do create the woolly mammoth, there may be some inductive generalizations that we can make, and there may be others that we can't make. And so, you know, this is um, uh, not something which she wanted to speculate about, and not something that she thought was important for developing her own view, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, then finally, at the end, we talked about her Dewey lectures and her pessimism about the state of philosophy. So. Um, uh, one of the things that she was very pessimistic about was this urge to publish, this drive to publish early on as much as possible, and the way graduate students are just conditioned to think that you have to publish, 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 and then obviously what happens, a lot of stuff that gets published, no one reads, it's all crap, most of it's crap, um, and no one reads it, no one cites it, it makes no difference, and um, uh, it, it doesn't really allow us to think deeply about issues, which is the whole point of doing philosophy, one might have thought. So she said that, you know, if she was a graduate student today, she doesn't think that she could have survived because her books took years and years. She's a slow writer. And I think those are important points. Um, I certainly feel that the, the, the pressure to publish forced me to publish things that I didn't want published at the time that I would have, that I wanted to hold back. I didn't think they were good, but I had this opportunity to get it published and I couldn't pass that up because I was on the tenure club. Um, now that I'm a full professor, I can kind of take more care in what I actually do publish. And so I've turned down several opportunities um, where people said, here, contribute to this or that special project, special book issue, uh, journal issue, whatever. Whereas in the past, I would have never done that because my tenure was on the line being promoted to full professor was on the line. Um, and so this allows me to think, to rework, and so forth. I think that's very, very important. Uh, what can we do to fix it? Well, her one suggestion was that we should appeal to the APA, the American Philosophical Association, and that they need to somehow arbitrate or um, uh, uh, contact universities and alert them to the special nature of philosophy 
that they, um, what counts as significant contribution to philosophy is different than some of these other fields maybe. And so, you know, I think professional organizations are very important. I personally have lost faith in the APA. Um, uh, I was a member for many years and not anymore. I'm waiting to see if the new management is going to have an effect. Maybe I'll come back. I just haven't enjoyed the conferences. I haven't really seen uh, anything that represents my interests um, or things that I care about coming out of there until very recently. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I took a wait and see. I, it would be interesting to see what would happen if the APA got involved in, in a responsible manner, actually perform some of its duties of a professional organization, which I haven't seen it. Do at least in the you know this, since I've been doing this since uh, I was a member probably started in two thousand and two or something like that. Anyway, so of course also in our discussion was um, the role of the study of history. So I asked her. She says well, I think studying history is incredibly important, um, and doing philosophy requires a deep engagement with historical figures. I thought that was very fascinating because many women suggest that um, the lack of representation of women in philosophy is. The lack of women, the lack of women in philosophy might be related to the fact that they don't see women in the canon, in the in the corpus of the history. So there are a lot of old dead white dudes and not a lot of old dead women. <laughs> so that's a problem. And she didn't seem to think it was a problem. She said it never occurred to her, and um, she thinks studying history is very important. And um, um, this wasn't the source of the issue for her. So that's a kind of very, very general rough overview of a lot of the themes that came up. Of course, hearing her own responses would have been much more informative. Um, but this gives you some idea of some of the things we talk about and how it relates to intentionality and introspection, which was the theme for this month.